worship. I trust that a number of you are able to join us remotely from uh, the comfort as well as the security of your homes this morning as we do worship a little differently. Today, uh, I uh, will be leading us in worship here from the uh, church sanctuary, and we will be endeavoring to allow that to be our connection for today. I have several folks here this morning with us, a little team that is uh, working behind the scenes to make sure the video feed and the audio uh, work as we hope they do. Uh, and we appreciate your patience as we maybe work out a few of the kinks in the days ahead. But welcome to worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of worship. Father, these are unprecedented times, and we are all learning how to do church a little bit differently. And so, Father, we pray that you might bless our efforts to stay both informed and connected as the body of Christ. Father, we recognize that technology is very helpful, but it is not the complete story. And so we pray that you might continue to lead us and guide us as we find new and creative ways to stay informed and connected and do ministry during this season in the life of your church. We do ask your blessing upon this time of worship. Lord, we pray for each and every person who has been able to log in and view this time together. We pray that our audience might expand. We pray, Lord, for uh, each and every person to be able to uh, do the simple thing of being able to push the right button and be able to enjoy our worship together. We thank you for your grace and your kindness in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, once again, welcome to worship. This is going to be primarily a time of worship, but of course, as pastor, I do want to make sure we do what we can to keep you informed of some things relative to the adjustments we're making and seeking to continue to do in light of these unprecedented times. Just a reminder, for the remainder of the month of March, uh, there'll be no gatherings here at the facilities of the church uh, during this time, and that would include worship next weekend. I do have a very small team uh, here this morning, and we are respecting the CDC guidelines for small groups such as this, uh, but we covet your prayers for the days ahead. My main message and the main thing I want to say to you by way of update is this. While the doors of our building are now closed, the church is open. We just need to discover new ways and new pathways of ministry in the days ahead. We're not going away. The body of Christ is not going away. God is still present with us. And so while temporarily we've had to shut the doors to a building, we have not shut the doors to the church. And I covet your ideas and suggestions and prayers together as we discover new avenues new pathways, new ways of doing some things in the days ahead. A couple of things that I want to mention specifically. Uh, next week, we hope to enhance this worship experience, so we do appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, in terms of uh, the Mariner family, uh, your offerings, uh, we pray that you might continue that because uh, the ongoing expenses of the church uh, continue as we seek to uh, continue to do ministry within the appropriate guidelines. Uh, we welcome you to uh, mail those to the church, or as long as we're able to have the church office open, you're welcome to drop them off. Uh, this week, we will be looking into uh, means that you might simply and securely uh, contribute to the work of the church and send your tithes and offerings uh, in an electronic manner, and we'll have more updates on you that uh, as well. The little pastor chats during the week from my office will continue. Uh, we will continue to send out regular email. Uh, the church webpage has been uh, redesigned and simplified so that you can get the latest information there. Uh, this uh, worship service, as well as other recordings, will be posted there, uh, and so you can revisit them in the future and uh, experience uh, those messages uh, at uh, a time of your leisure. The final thing I want to mention is something I'll be working on this week that I'm simply calling Family of Five. We recognize that technology is very helpful and this virtual world can uh, serve us, but in the days ahead we realize that uh, we may want something a little bit more personal. So stay tuned for Family of Five in which we will seek to uh, break down the congregation into some smaller groups 
uh, in and through which we can be informed and connected with one another as the body of Christ. Stay tuned. And now, as our call to worship, I would invite us all to read together the 23rd Psalm. This is a psalm, I think, that brings great assurance to us during this particular season in the life of the church. Those words should be on your screen, and I invite you, together with me, to read these aloud. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I trust these words from Scripture are a reminder to us of the goodness of our shepherd and of his presence with us in each and every circumstance of life. That that is a presence in which uh, God, by his grace and mercy, will continue to provide and direct his church, direct his flock and the sheep of his pasture in a way that would bring honor to him and would allow us to experience his grace with us each day. This morning, I would like us to go to a passage of Holy Scripture for a few minutes. And in this passage of scripture, it is my prayer that you and I might not only find comfort, but some direction in these very uh, difficult and challenging times. This is from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. The words should be coming up on your screen, but perhaps you will want to open your Bible as well, entirely up to you. Hear these words of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything that is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Rejoice. Easier said than done, isn't it? We live in a time where rejoicing uh, can be difficult, to say the least. After all, what is to be there to rejoice in that we find ourselves in a time when we are threatened by a very fearful and scary virus that uh, has now spread around our world. Uh, it is a time when we have been asked to socially disconnect and distance ourselves from one another at the very time when we would love to come together and be together face to face to encourage, to uplift, and to serve one another. And yet that particular opportunity is one that for the time being we've been asked to forego for the health benefit of us all. And so when the Apostle Paul, who writes these words, says rejoice, we really can't blame ourselves if we say, yeah, right. <laughs> Easier said than done. Yet, I'd like to remind us of a couple of things. First of all, think with me for a moment 
is about the person who is writing these words. He's a gentleman by the name of Paul. He is one of the primary leading characters in what we know as the New Testament in the Bible. Early in his life, he hated and despised Christians and Christianity, but was miraculously converted as a young man and became one of the great missionaries of the early church. He was such an ardent follower of Jesus Christ that the governing authorities of his day finally put him in prison, hoping to silence him. But even from prison, Paul continued to minister through a ministry of writing letters to the churches that he had planted or helped encourage. And the book of Philippians is one of those letters, and yes, he is writing this letter literally from a prison cell in the Roman Empire. So before we too quickly say, yeah, easier said than done, let's remember that Paul too, even as he wrote these words of encouragement and instruction, was living through a period of time when he, like us, could say, oh yes, rejoice, it's so much easier said than done. But God never asked us to do anything that he has not given us the resource to do. And as we read this passage and we're asked to rejoice, we are given two very specific responses that allow us, hopefully, that even though our hearts may not be fully engaged, we can still choose to rejoice at the level of grace that God may give us. The first response that this passage mentions is the response of prayer. The response of prayer. I don't know about you, but in times like this, I'm not really sure what or how I ought to be praying. Certainly there are the obvious things. At the top of that list certainly are those that are directly affected by this virus and to pray for their comfort and their healing. Close to that, of course, are those that uh, have been gifted by God in the area of research and uh, all the attendant disciplines that are seeking to find a cure that this virus might be eradicated from our experience. And as believers and followers of God, we're praying for them on a regular basis. But I would like to remind us that according to the scriptures, even when we don't know how to pray, it's okay. Because elsewhere in the scriptures, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf to God even when we don't know quite what to say ourselves. We're also told elsewhere in the scriptures that Jesus Christ sits today at the right hand of God, and as the Bible puts it, makes intercession or prays for his people on an ongoing basis. So even when you find the words difficult to come by, recognize that God himself has a plan for that as well. And this morning as we gather together, the Holy Spirit of God and the Son of God are petitioning on your behalf and my behalf before God's throne. Nevertheless, in this passage, there are a couple of specific recommendations. When we pray, we're asked to pray about all things. There is nothing exempt. There is nothing too small. There is nothing too great to pray about. For example, years ago, seemingly an eternity ago, when I was a college student at the University of Iowa, I, uh, I had a job which required me to have a car, and so uh, I would drive to the campus. I, I lived at home and uh, uh, committed to uh, my classes on a regular basis. Parking was a challenge on campus. It was difficult to find a parking place, particularly finding a parking place close to the building in which your particular class was going to be held. And so quite regularly, I prayed that God would give me a parking place. Now that might seem particularly a little mundane and trite, particularly in the present situation, but it was a need I chose to share with God. And I'm not going to suggest to you that every time I drove to campus, there was a miraculous provision of a parking place. But there were a few times where, oh my goodness, there is a parking place and it happens to be close to the building that I am attending class in. My lesson there is simply this. There is nothing seemingly too small that we cannot share with God. So please pray about the little things, knowing that God loves to hear them. 
and then you may even find yourself a parking place that you did not formally expect to find. But God also invites you to pray about the big things as well. Obviously, the coronavirus and all the issues surrounding it that we're experiencing is something that's much on our prayer list. I remember another instance in my life when uh, I moved from praying to parking places to something a little larger, a little deeper. We received word quite suddenly and out of the blue that my father had an inoperable brain tumor. And so at the time I was in graduate school in Colorado, my parents were still in Iowa. And my wife and I and my youngest son packed up. We went to Iowa to be bedside with my dad as he faced a surgery that um, uh, would hopefully allow at least his life to be prolonged a bit. That was the first time in my memory that I can remember hitting my knees beside my bed that night and literally praying all night. A year later, my father did pass into the Lord's presence. And I learned to take comfort from the hope of resurrection and from the incredible memories that I had growing up with a father who, in my experience, I was blessed to have someone who uh, was very attentive and, and, and very encouraging and a powerful influence in my life that continues to this day. That obviously was a much greater need, a much greater request, and a very similar request to which I know a number of you listening to this and participating in this worship time have experienced as well. So the first recommendation of prayer is to please pray about all things, those that seem small, those that are big, and everything in between. The other recommendation of this passage is remember not only to simply pray for ourselves, but pray for others. The word petition is used in this particular passage of scripture. The term means to intercede for someone else. And so I encourage you as you pray, do not think only about ourselves, as important as that is. Take time to think about people beyond your individual situation, beyond your family, beyond whatever group you find yourselves in. And be praying regularly for other people. There's something about adding others to our prayer list that, that lift our sense of connection with God and the peace of God that this passage mentioned us. Pray for all things. Pray for others. A few years ago, I remember reading a statement from one leader of the church who had these words in summary. He said, pray as you can, not as you can't. So as we think of our prayer life in these days, I simply invite you to pray as you can. Don't worry about coming up with all the, the right words. Don't feel like God is looking for some sort of specific terminology to listen to you. Simply pray as you can. Perhaps praying as you can means that uh, you're a bit angry with God right now. I think that's pretty normal. We feel like, where is he in the midst of this crisis? Where, where is God showing up? Is he going to show up? We're feeling that sense of anxiety rising in our hearts. And I suggest to you that that is something God wants to hear about too. Trust me. He's big enough. He can handle it. And he's heard it before. Pray for others. Pray for all things. Pray as you can. The other response to the admonition here to rejoice is not simply a response of prayer, but a response to reflect. And specifically to reflect upon some specific things. The Apostle says, instead of keeping your eyes focused on your immediate circumstances, lift them up and think about, meditate upon, wonder about whatever is true, noble, right, pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, these are the things he invites us to think about. I was 
at with my wife a number of years ago, a marriage conference. And the man and his wife who were leading that conference were seeking to teach us some principles to enhance our marriage experience. For those of you that are or have been married, you know that marriage can be a bit rugged at times. I don't know about you, but Barb and I have always appreciated any and all the help we can get. The woman was sharing a story of one day in the bedroom picking up her husband's socks that he had summarily simply left on the floor instead of depositing them in the hamper. And she could feel the tide of resentment and anger kind of growing in her soul. And in her mind, she was thinking this, would it really be that difficult for him to put these socks in the appropriate place instead of me having to come behind him and pick them up? And so her mind immediately went to the negative. And she said, in the midst of that, it was like the Holy Spirit interrupted her and reminded her that she had a husband who loved her and for whom she could pick up socks in the first place. I think we've all been there in one form or another. We've been asked to do a task. And that task seems a bit menial, and it's something that maybe we feel like we've been asked to do, but, well, we wouldn't have to do it if someone else had been a bit more attentive. And the story reminds us that even in the midst of that, if we take time and lift our eyes, lift our sights from our circumstances and think about those things in our life which remain pure, lovely, admirable, be thankful for our families, be thankful for our presence, be thankful for our homes, be thankful for those who are going to work each day in at least a few of the service industries so that we can uh, uh, still have food and, and clothing and, and goods. Thank you that you're able to enjoy this worship this morning in a virtual capacity and the list could go on. Two things that I believe can help us as we seek to rejoice during these challenging times. First of all, pray. And then reflect on what is lovely. The final thing I would like to point out from this passage is a promise. We are promised here that if we will do these things, the peace of God, which is transcending all our understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? May I suggest to you that it is a gift of God that as we pray and as we reflect, that will enable us to think about and be encouraged, encouraged about those things which are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and, and admirable. We recognize this kind of prayer and reflection is simply not humanly possible in our own strength. But as we make the choice to pray and reflect, we do have a promise here that God will enter into that process with us and keep our minds and our hearts focused upon the Lord. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that most of you got the word, and if you didn't, that's okay. This um, live worship will be uh, posted as a video, both on the church website and will remain here on Facebook in the days ahead. So if you wish to revisit, feel free. But I hope many of you got the word that I would like to lead you in the simplest of worship acts this morning, the service of Holy Communion. And so if you have gathered your bread and uh, whatever you are using, be it grape juice or something else, we encourage you to get that right now. Hello there. Yes, I am here in our lovely sanctuary before the altar of the Lord, the table of remembrance, the table that holds a Bible, that has our candles, which, if you see, they're lit. God's here. He's with us. He is the light of the world. 
and he's with us this morning. Praise God. But also on this table are the elements of Holy Communion. And so now I would like to lead us in this simplest and most fundamental act of worship and praise and means of grace that God has provided to us. May I remind us that in the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed and went to Calvary's cross, that prior to that, he gathered with his 12 closest followers for one final meal together. It is a meal that has been commemorated and repeated by the Church of Jesus Christ ever since that first meeting in that upper room. And in that room, he passed bread as he had done so many times at so many other meals. But at this particular time, he broke the bread and he passed it. And as he passed the bread, he told his disciples, this bread, as of today and for every celebration moving forward, is a reminder of my body which is given for you. And that as often as we should eat of it, we should do so in remembrance of him. We invite you to take and eat of the bread of the Lord. Following the bread, Jesus took the cup. And as he had done so many times, he passed it among his disciples. But he said this cup, in particular, represents the sacrifice about to be given in my blood. My blood, which is to be shed for the remission and forgiveness of sins for every man, woman, and child, whoever lived, who is living at the time, who is living right down to this very moment, that we receive this element as well. I invite you to take whatever element you have prepared for this time, and with me, and with the entire body of Christ, let us drink of it, remembering as we do the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious and merciful God, we are grateful for this time of worship. And though we have celebrated it a little bit differently than usual, one thing does not change. That is your presence amongst us. Father, you have not social distanced yourself from us in any way, shape, or form. You are here in our midst. And we just pray for your ongoing and continued guidance and direction and grace as we seek to continue to be the arms and feet of Jesus to one another and to our community as well. We pray and ask these things in the precious name of Christ our Lord and all God's family said, Amen. Thanks for joining us today once again. This live broadcast will be uh, saved on Facebook as a uh, recording. So uh, if you were not able to tune in today, or perhaps you know of someone who uh, would like to, or you just want to come back in the future, just know this will remain on Facebook, and we'll be posting within the next day a link to it on the church webpage as well. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I'll be keeping the church, and you do the same. And please remember, absolutely, most of all, God loves you so very much. God bless.